How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. You might not know this, but before I record an episode, I like to break a sweat. And I do that using the Chop Fit. Over the course of the past year, the Chop Fit has allowed me to lose weight, tone up my body, and feel even more amazing about myself. A feeling that you should all feel about yourselves as well. If you use this code, SpearChop10, you get $10 off your order. Once again, use code SpearChop10 for $10 off your Chop Fit order. It'll change your life. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spirit Talk. And today, uh, we have an incredible guest. Uh, we have Dr. Richard Gallagher. He's a board-certified psychiatrist, professor, in New York Medical under psychiatry, a psychoanalyst with the faculty of Columbia University, the author of Demonic Foes, uh, which I definitely want to get into. Uh, and he's the foremost scientific expert on the subject of diabolic attacks. Dr. Gallagher, awesome to have you here today. Well, thank you for the invitation, John. One of the, uh, so I started this podcast last year at the onset of the pandemic, and I've been trying to research different topics um, that involve under the umbrella of security. And I was, as I was doing research, I had uh, other, uh, I've had therapists on the show, I've had mental health experts. Uh, in the back of my mind, I've always been thinking, what else is out there in the, in the psyche and the brain and stuff? And obviously, growing up, uh, Christian, Catholic, uh, I've always believed in God, angels, but I've also believed the demons aspect. And so I simply went to Google and typed in, who is the expert on demonology or real life exorcisms? And you were the first person that popped up. And as soon as I saw that, I, I found your book. I read that immediately, passed it off to two other people who immediately emailed you. And here we are today. So again, thank you very much for being here. Got it, got it. You, you throw a wide umbrella on your show. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things too where a lot of people resonate with different topics, whether it is mental health or leadership or martial arts or self defense or veteran affairs. Um, and one of these things here with this, I uh, I'm a big proponent of mental health and a lot of the stuff you talk about in here. Um, yeah, the sensationalism I think Hollywood kind of brought me into the idea of oh, the exorcist or devil's advocate or Constantine, all these demons, all these, the pop culture aspect of it. But there is something very intriguing to me and how you're able to break it down in this book from a scientific approach uh, is pretty impressive. Thank you. So how did you kind of, and I, I don't want to get too much of the book because I want people to read this, but your relationship with Father Jax and how he's able to, when he first approaches you, it comes up to you and basically catches you off guard with this case. Before that moment happened, were you satisfied with what you're doing or were you anticipating the back of your mind that one day something like this could come approach your way? Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that something like that would come my way. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, John, everything I have done in this field, literally, has been because people have asked me to do it. I didn't really volunteer for any of this. So, you know, to just give a, a quick overview, this uh, this priest, I use a pseudonym, I, call, I called him Father Jacques in the book. And he came to my office at Cornell Medical College where I was working at the time and wanted to tell me about a case. I said, well, you know, Father, I, I just I just finished my training at Yale and I said I'm a pretty, you know, mainstream professor of psychiatry. I'm sort of skeptical of a lot of that stuff. And he said, Well, then you're the perfect man for the job. And I continued to work with him and a colleague of his. And I saw, because there weren't very many exorcists at the time in the United States, I saw a tremendous amount of cases. Now I'm not I'm not implying that possessions are common, they're not. People sometimes say to me in the course of your normal work, because I've, I've also been a very busy psychiatrist, they say in the course of your normal work, how many patients have you seen and how many patients were possessed? And I see, I, I tell people I've, I've seen more than about 25,000 cases and they're surprised, especially if they're kind of fundamentalist, they're surprised when I say of those 25,000 individual patients, official people that I was asked to evaluate, 
as a board certified psychiatrist, which I am, zero are possessed. You know, these are not people right. that are in this coming into my office and I'm saying, oh, by the way, sir, you happen to be possessed. The reason I've seen so many of these cases uh, is because I get, I get calls from all over the world and I usually get calls from clergy who already suspect there may be something going on and uh, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes I have to tell those individuals, well, you know, you're, you're exaggerating the demonic element of it. Uh, but that, that's why, that's why I've, I've seen in my, my old chairman who was a Catholic as well, uh, he's now retired. He, he wrote that I've probably seen more of these cases than any other physician in the world, maybe, maybe in history, because now you have the internet, people can, People can right. get on Zoom. People can, you know, uh, uh, ask me a consultation all over the world. Actually, with the pandemic, the last year and a half, two years have been kind of crazy. Obviously, have you seen any differences in your field, or whether it is normal cases you've dealt with, or say an uptick in people who feel uh, that depression and uh, stuff like that actually can affect them and manifest these ideas. What it might look like a possession, but in reality, you determine that it's not. Well, there's no question that you know, uh, probably in in many many countries, the rates of anxiety and depression have gone up during the pandemic. But no, I, I don't I don't think that necessarily affects my work with these other sorts of individuals who generally there are a few exceptions, but generally. You know, if you have a demonic attack, a serious one, and the most serious are possessions, you don't normally have a mental illness. The one, the, one of the cases in the book, we we'll call it Catherine, um, as you do. Uh, she, you mentioned it could be a psychic uh, depression, uh, the selective hearing, and you hand her these pieces of paper, and she doesn't recall or even see the word God or whatever, and all this craziness. With a case like that, is it what like what are your telltale signs to cut through kind of like the BS at the beginning before you kind of realize that hey, this isn't something as simple as depression or just a, a, a normal mental health disorder? Well, I always tell people, and I, I I write it in my book, Demonic Foes, um, because I felt again, you know, people ask me to write it, people ask me to join the International Association of Exorcists. Um, so again, everything I've done, I've kind of been asked to do. And in the book, I, I, I talk about, it's not a simple thing to summarize in um, 30 seconds, but I summarize you know, how you make that distinction between mental illness and, or, or some kind of medical illness could be as well. And um, let's, let's take the example of possession. And, what you have to have is the total picture has to be suggestive of a demonic attack rather than a mental illness. So obviously there are many, many people in this country who can diagnose mental illness fairly well. But you wanna see when you're evaluating a person and it's possible they could be stressed or a little bit depressed as, as the woman Catherine was. But you want to see certain, um, we'd call it technically pathognomonic, meaning certain features that cannot be explained by mental illness, or for that matter, cannot be explained by materialism. Now, the, the, the classic criteria, which I've seen in many cases of possession, are, you know, is this person in knowledgeable about things that they could never be knowledgeable otherwise. For instance, uh, a Satanist I talk about in the book, she knew how a lot of people died, including my mother of ovarian cancer years earlier. Now, a second, a second sign is they have some kind of weird abnormal movements or super strength. And the strength of these individuals goes far beyond sort of a a manic or a psychotic individual. And in some cases, it's quite bizarre. Uh, for instance, even though I've never seen one myself, I've talked to maybe 30 plus individuals who 
who swear to me they they saw a patient levitate. Um, and finally, there's um, very commonly in serious possessions, there's the ability, even in a very uneducated or you know, not particularly uh, highly intelligent person, uh, the ability to speak languages. And I've heard that as well. So those things sort of indicate, and they've been used for hundreds of years. Uh, in fact, those are the suggestive criteria most pronounced in the venerable Roman ritual of 1614, which is, which is still good advice in many respects. And those things clearly go beyond what a human being can do. And they suggest the, the presence of a foreign spirit. Now, just real quick, that's also in the context of other things. You want to take a good history. You want to rule out mental illness. You want to understand the context. So let's take the example I write about in the book. Uh, most prominently, this woman I call Julia, who was an extremely flamboyant possession. Now she had all those paranormal, let's call them signs, but she also was a practicing Satanist. And, you know, she told me, you know, some people say, well, can't some of these people with these paranormal powers, like, like knowing things that they, they normally humanly couldn't know, uh, maybe they're gifted individuals. And there are some people who have spiritual gifts. I don't deny that, but you know they're, they're not exhibiting all this other stuff. And this Satanist woman, Julia, said to me quite clearly, "I'm not a gifted person. I have these gifts because I worship Satan and because Satan gave it to me." So she was a little more aware because of her satanic practice. Again, I don't want to convey the impression as a, as a very experienced psychiatrist, I went through what they call the satanic panic of 30 years ago, where everybody was saying, you know, right. Satanists are, uh, you know, around every corner. I do not believe that. But this was, this woman was the real deal. And she knew where she got her psychic abilities, which again, go beyond human nature. We call it pretty natural. Uh, she knew, she knew darn well that she she was granted this by because of her allegiance with Satan. With the impact of Hollywood and mainstream TV and pop culture, and you mentioned uh, William Fredericton's The Exorcist, uh, and you talk about that and meeting Lorraine Warren, The Conjuring, for the people out there, The Conjuring series. This type of impact, do you think it hurts or helps? bring awareness to a field that obviously you care and you're passionate about uh, in today's day and age? I think it can work either way. You know, I mean, I, I met L Lorraine Warren. Uh, it was actually at the funeral of Father Jacques. And she's a lovely woman and she has a lot of experience. Now, some of those movies that are loosely based on real cases. And Father, Father Jacques also worked with her, by the way. Uh, you know, they, be, they become sensationalized, you know, so that you get a doll possessed, that sort of thing in some of these conjuring movies. So Hollywood, yes, can distort it. Uh, they particularly distort certain elements of it, which, you know, I can get into if you want. On the other hand, really since the original Exorcist, which was a, a reasonably well done movie, uh, not really a phantasmagorical because in fact it was based on a real case in Maryland. And Peter Blatty had changed the character from a, a young boy who had dabbled in spiritualism because he had a spiritualist aunt, um, got in over his head, which is the way many people will express this. And then they 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 changed they changed the character. Blatty changed the character in the book in the movie. And that was a little more of a realistic movie, and it 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 aroused a lot of very strong interest in this subject, right. which again is a plus and a minus, because on the one hand there are these rare cases, and you know it can alert society 
not only that there are these rare cases, and I emphasize that over and over, these cases are rare. On the other hand, um, and, and also it can, it can alert people to the fact that in the history of religion and spiritual literature, all societies have reported possessions. Uh, I mean, I could give a lot of references on that, scientific references, but basically pretty much all cultures have done this. Now, they have different interpretations. Right. But, you know, these cases have been reported, you know, as long as there's ancient, as long as we have recorded history. So in that sense, again, the Exorcist movie could alert people to the reality of the demonic. And I believe in demons, evil spirits, and I believe in the Christian view that they are unequivocally fallen angels, in part because once they're challenged during exorcisms, that's who they're forced to say they are. They, are. they don't want to say that. They want to say they're dead souls and gods and goddesses, you know, but they're forced eventually to submit. Uh, ultimately, I, as a Christian, believe they're submitting to Christ. Um, so making a public, which is part of why I wrote the book. I wrote the book to technically help, help exorcists, many of whom wanted me to write a book, but also to alert the public. So my book, a few of these movies done well, can alert society to the reality of the demonic. One of the things, well, before I jumped into your book. Let uh, me finish, John. John, if I can just finish. On the other hand, sometimes Hollywood gets it so wrong that it becomes ludicrous or, or they distort the picture. One of, the, one of the things they most do is they distort the picture as if exorcism is some magic mumbo jumbo. The person has to work at getting delivered too, although exorcism prayers are valuable. The, before, before I start reading your book, I went into a very naive, oh, I know everything about exorcisms or enough to understand, but I, I had no idea that when, before I started reading it, I only assumed that the Christian faith would deal with this, but when you talk about other religions and other uh, people that aren't necessarily religious being possessed, it kind of opened my idea to this whole this whole thing of yeah, there's a religious undertone, obviously, but there's more to it than that. You don't have to be this extreme devout Catholic to be attacked by a demon, or you could be someone who's not very religious. It's it's very kind of eye opening. The examples you use for all your cases in here, each one kind of broke down a different idea or a misconception I had before I started reading your book? Well, sometimes people will say, you know, there's a lot of, I call them armchair experts. And a lot of these people will say, well, how come these possessions are only found in, you know, Christians and fundamentalists? Nothing could be further from the truth. This has been reported throughout all history. If, if your audience wants a reference, they should read a guy named Osterreich. O-E-S-T, Osterreich. About 100 years ago, he did a, a, a chronology of history, and he shows that it happens in all different religions. Now, in a funny way, it's worse if you don't have a religion, because then you really get confused, and you don't know who to turn to. And those people are actually more desperate, because they don't know what the heck is going on. And, and those cases exist, of course. One of the coolest things about your book, your relationship with Father Jacques, Jacques it's, it, it, it kind of reminded me of a, he's almost like this, not only a mentor, but I, I'm not going to say like a father, almost like a brother figure, whoever he was, the relationship you guys had, how it went through the years, um, and I do, want, I, I do want to touch upon, on his deathbed, you being there, a big part of his life, when he died, did that inspire you to keep doing what you did or do you feel like you didn't have your 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 guy there that your guy is always there with you from day one well by that point i hadn't i had been invited to join the international association i actually was on their governing board for a while and i i've sort of been a scientific advisor i'm, I'm now the longest standing american member of that uh of course i'm not a priest i'm not an exorcist but you know I'm there as a kind of scientific expert. 
And by that point, I knew a fair John, a fair amount of other exorcists too, including the guy who was actually the chief exorcist who worked with Father Jacques. Uh, unfortunately, he's also passed away. But I mean, I know, you know, I knew Father Amorth when he was alive. I, I, I know many, many other prominent exorcists uh, in America now. So, yeah, I, I look, um, again, I'm, I'm a physician. So, there aren't that many people who can help these people or give them the scientific credibility that their case may well deserve. So when people come to me, they're often suffering and, uh, you know, I try to do what I can to help. I can't, I can't talk to everybody, but as a physician dedicated to relieving suffering, I felt I was in a position to help these individuals and, and help the clergy sometimes too, although the most experienced ones generally know what they're dealing with from the beginning. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think I would have stayed in the field, although I do, uh, I had become friends with Father Jacques. He was, you know, he was an older man. He might say an older man as a friend, and uh, he, he definitely was part of my learning curve at the beginning. So just, I, again, the relationship that you, you guys, we talked about in the book is incredible. Now, would you, can, if you could get a breakdown for the listeners, before an exorcism, what you're, you're going to, you've already done the research on, you've studied, you've met with the person, before that happens and after it happens, what do you do to get ready mentally and physically? Or do you just treat this each person uh, as a case and a, as the case goes, you build around it? Or how do you kind of separate yourself between each individual case you go through? Well, every case is a little bit different. And in a way, even though the Catholic Church has a lot of strong uh, criteria for evaluations and for, you know, how an exorcism is conducted. It's also true at the same time that every exorcism is a little bit different because every case is a little bit different and the exorcists have their own personalities as well. So, um, I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the position where these are not patients of mine. So I'm there for consultation. Sometimes that's required by the church. Uh, not in all countries, but in America, you know, the bishops are ultimately responsible to designate somebody who, um, you know, can help discern. And uh, pretty much all possessions in the Catholic orbit will have some kind of medical evaluation. Um, but then it depends on the case. I mean, I may be asked to attend the exorcism where I I'm just attending, not as an exorcist. I, I keep my mouth shut actually and just observe. And then my observations, since I've seen a lot of exorcisms, may be valuable to the participants. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not as if I'm, you know, going on to, to treat these people, you know. How many cases, with all the cases you've done with the exorcisms and all the notes and the stuff you've done, do you still own every single note? Like, how do you keep this all organized? Uh, I keep it mostly organized in my head. I don't take a lot of notes on these cases because I don't want people, you know, ever to feel like I would in any way violate their confidentiality or be, you know, requested to have notes. And, and again, John, remember, I don't have to because these are not patients. Right. It's just very, I'm, I'm so interested by the idea of your psych, psychiatric work and into the possession stuff where you have that fine line where... HIPAA obviously protects in the, the stuff on your one side, your main job, but the other side, if they aren't patients, you still have a duty to protect them, which is kind of cool. Yeah, but it would be like me dealing with almost any other subject with a patient outside of my professional practice. You know, I'm generally not charging these people. Uh, I'm not treating them. You know, I may say to the individual, look, you need treatment. And, you know, then they'll go to somebody else. Uh, or I may say, say to somebody, look, uh, you know, if I were you, I would continue working with this exorcist. And I may say, look, you know, with your permission, I may attend the exorcism, but again, I'm not gonna officially treat you. So it's, it's very different, you know, I mean, HIPAA really doesn't apply to something like that. So how is someone that wants to uh, start with your line of career with psychiatric work and all this, but then they get interested, say they have a father, Jacques, who comes to them, uh, how do they put themselves in that position to get to that level where you were asked by Father Jacques? Or is this something that 
an industry where you are actively looking for people to follow in your footsteps? Well, in the book, I did. I definitely wanted to enlighten mental health people among, among several goals of the book. I wanted to enlighten mental health people to the to the possibility or the rarity of these kind of things, and I certainly wanted to educate you know some exorcists who some of them are are quite knowledgeable already, but some of them can use a little more education. Uh, now remember, John, I told you I never volunteered for anything. I'm not sure it is a good idea to volunteer. Uh, I mean, if somebody really feels somehow a calling, you know, they really should should attach themselves to their local, you know, diocese and, and ask if they can be of service. Uh, they should also prepare themselves spiritually. I wouldn't do this work if I didn't have, a, you know, some kind of spiritual life myself. I never set myself up as some paragon, but, you know, I certainly practice my religion and I also have people praying for me. Uh, I think that gives me an added protection. I wouldn't do this without that. And somebody should not go into this lightly. Uh, yeah, I mean, there have been people who have come to me in the mental health field asking for specialized training. There's also a couple of organizations, some, some of which I've addressed that will train, you know, mental health people and exorcists both. Uh, but, you know, one, one should not go into this field lightly as a volunteer. I was not a volunteer. Doesn't mean that, you know, if somebody wants to be of service, they could probably, you know, contact their local diocese or something. Do you ever have nightmares, or maybe nightmares is not the right word, or flashbacks to different stuff that's happened in your life in this field, Dr. Gallagher? Or do you just kind of, once it's over, you're just like, put that in the back of my mind and move on? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm never indifferent to the suffering, you know, and it would be like, you know, do I ever forget? you know, a horrible case of uh, a psychiatric patient. Uh, but I but I am, you know, uh, I've been described as a little unflappable. So I can, I, can, I can move on, you know, generally. It's not like I've, you know, had personal experiences where I feel, you know, I've been attacked or had trauma from flashbacks or anything. Now, obviously, Demonic Foes, great book. I suggest everyone pick it up. I actually found it, uh, oddly enough, in a, it was in the wrong section of a Barnes & Noble. I was looking for uh, outdoor books. And this was literally put there by someone. I picked it up. I go, you know what? This might not be anything about mushrooms, but I'm into it. So when people, your goal for when people find this book, um, obviously if they're actively looking for it, you know what kind of what their gist is. But as you as you were writing the book, how many drafts did you have to kind of put together where you kind of finalized on the one book you think everyone that wants to read this book should read about? I mean, just if your audience is interested, I mean, I'm, I'm not on your show to push the book, really. Uh, thank you for mentioning it. But, you know, it's, it's very easily available on Amazon, you know. Uh, it took me a while to write the book because it is really a distillation of my 25 plus years experience in this area. What really impressed me was the publisher, because, you know, HarperCollins, I think it's the second biggest publishing company in the world. They let me write the book I wanted to write. In other words, I didn't write a book just to be sensational or to be, you know, I mean, obviously all the characters, even though every detail in the book is true, you know, uh, I use a lot of pseudonyms and, you know, keep people's identity confidential, but I, it's, a, it's also a serious book. You know, it's like aim for the educated reader. It's, it's I, don't, I don't oversimplify, you know, because it's a complex field that has quite frankly confused people throughout all of history. I mean, you know, if I can, if I can digress a little bit, you know, people throughout history have reported these rare events. They've often been confused about it and sometimes they've confused, you know, multiple personality or psychotic individuals or very suggestible individuals uh, or people with epilepsy. They've said, oh, these people must be possessed. And, you know, we can distinguish those. And, and you know, again, I write, it, write in the book about each of those types of cases, how to distinguish it from a genuine possession, which is much more rare. But throughout history, people have been aware 
that this parapsychological stuff exists. And then they've come up with their own explanations. For instance, uh, you know, um, oracles in Greece used to have a voice speaking through them and they and the voice would say, I'm Zeus or I'm Apollo. Now, you know, in the Hindu uh, religion, a lot of people still believe in gods and goddesses. We don't tend in the Western world uh, to believe in that stuff very much. But, you know, the Greeks were an educated populist this supposed voice, there's always controversy about these things. People always have a million different theories. But in my opinion, these oracles, like the Oracle of Delphi, were revealing genuine hidden knowledge. Where were they getting it from? In my opinion, they were getting it from evil spirits. So all throughout history, people have had different theories about this. Maybe it's a pagan deity. Maybe it's a dead soul. And, and these spirits will often lie. And I've even had a spirit say in my presence, you know, uh, I'm Zeus. Uh, now, I didn't believe him, of course, but, you know, he was hoping some you know, pagan people would probably believe him. Uh, very often, people come to me and they say, you know, Judas is possessing me or Nero is possessing me or, you know, my wicked grandfather is possessing me. In the, in the Jewish tradition, they, they have often believed, and some, some still do, that an entity called Dibix, which are de deceased souls, are uh, uh, possessing the individual. In my opinion, based on my experience, it's not just based on the theory, uh, you know, the Christians have it right, uh, that these are evil spirits, and they lie. They lie until they're forced not to lie. And when they're forced not to lie, they reveal that they're an evil spirit. And they also um, uh, reveal their, 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 their true um, name. And they do it reluctantly because they're humiliated. They feel they've had to submit to this you know, priest. I remember somebody called, uh, one, one of these evil spirits called Father Jacques you know, get the get the F away, you monkey priest. They, they regard human beings as their inferiors. So we're just like evolved animals to them. And, you know, they think they're so superior that we should uh, submit to them. So in history, it really was the, um, the ancient Hebrews, the early Christians, and then, you know, mostly, mostly the Muslims, who began to recognize that, you know, the gods and goddesses of the pagan world were, were not really, did not really exist, and that at least a fair amount of times, if it wasn't just somebody's imagination, uh, these gods and goddesses were evil spirits who were lying. And so the major monotheistic religions all came to that conclusion that you know there are there are uh, fallen angels who can possess individuals and they, they still can. Wow, incredible! I'm are you surprised that someone in Hollywood hasn't come knocking on your door about creating a universe that's based on your your life? Am I surprised what? That Hollywood hasn't come on your door and been like, you know what? Who this says who says they haven't? I love it. Because I, 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 you're such a great storyteller. Obviously, the book uh, showcases that. But everything you've dealt with, and I, I can't stress enough, you don't read this book because you want to hear the, the gory, the crazy. You read this for a scientific approach, but very easy to read. Because uh, I was actually almost kind of afraid to be like, you might use some of these terms you have from medical school and your career where it's like, I don't know what he's talking about. But the way you wrote it, it was super easy to read, yet so informative. And I can just, I can just imagine right now, and you mentioned earlier with Anna Lorraine, uh, Warren, how Hollywood kind of changed some of their stuff around. But you live a life that I think, I, I think this would be, it would be really cool to see your life get put out there even more where take out the sensationalism of it, but the work you've done to actually help people, whether it is mental illness or with possessions, it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. Well, you always have to be a little careful with what uh, Hollywood does with your stories. Right. 
I'm not really trying to become a celebrity. But getting back to your point about the book, you're the type of person, a thoughtful, educated person. And, you know, it doesn't have to be Catholic or Christian. Right. Uh, you're the kind of reader I wrote it for. You know, I wrote it for the educated reader. Now, I, I put enough about psychiatry in there that I think mental health people can appreciate it. I certainly put enough that, uh, you know, expertise that exorcists themselves can benefit from it. And, and many of them asked me to write the book. But I wrote it at the level of kind of the educated reader, not at the level of some kind of jargon filled, you know, over right. technical scientific study. It could, it could have been so easy for you to just be like, oh, this is exorcism, all oh, so and so. But the fact you are so honest with yourself shows the respect you have towards your field and exactly what exactly you're doing. It's just really re like reaffirming to hear you and see you talk about this stuff and write about it, where you look at stuff from a scientific approach, fact based, and some stuff you can't explain. You're not afraid to say that. And again, this book is I can't recommend this book enough. It's just an awesome book. See, and I'm not disparaging. I, I mean, I understand why psychiatrists are skeptical because, you know, we all see schizophrenic patients who, because of their brain based pathology, think an evil spirit is talking to them. We've all seen, or many of us have seen, you know, multiple personalities, which is, which is now called dissociative identity disorder where a supposed alter, we, we've seen suggestible individuals, sometimes exploited by fundamentalist ministers into believing they're possessed or something. So we've seen this. We know that sometimes people's memory is off. So some people will manufacture memory about, you know, having been ritually abused and all that. So you, you need a certain skepticism. And that's what psychiatrists say. So they, they kind of overgeneralize and say, well, you know, all these possession cases must be one of these particular pathologies. But I mentioned that demons kind of have hidden in history as pronouncing themselves dead souls, pronouncing themselves gods and goddesses, or other types of spirits, you know. Uh, in my opinion, this is another way they hide. They hide as somebody suffering from a medical or psychiatric disorder. And, you know, they probably are there. They seem to be sadistic and they're probably kind of laughing at the stupidity of humans. Right. But, I, but I don't, you know, I don't blame my colleagues in psychiatry. Uh, in fact, when, when, you know, I understand why they believe what they do because of the pathology they see. On the other hand, when people say to me, well, Gallagher, you're kind of out of the mainstream. I say, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm a lot of the mainstream in my profession. Well, you know, I'm a respected psychiatrist. I'm a professor. Uh, I'm a full professor. So, you know, I seem to have been able to survive. On the other hand, you know, uh, my opinions are closer to the majority of Americans. The majority of Americans not only believe in the devil, they believe that there can be demonic activity. And if you look at world history, as opposed to the Western world since the Enlightenment, say, if you look at world history, and as a matter of fact, in almost all cultures to this day, you know, I'm in the mainstream. I mean, these cultures have always believed in evil spirits. And you go to a place like Madagascar or Haiti today, I mean, you know, probably 99% of the population not only believes in this, they know somebody who's, you know, seem to have exhibit some kind of demonic activity. So no, I, I tell people I'm not I'm not ahead of the mainstream. Maybe you are. This uh, this has been awesome, Dr. Gallagher. I uh, I appreciate the time. Uh, but again, the, the book Demonic Foes is incredible. Highly recommend it. Now, if, if someone does have a question for you or uh, whatever it is, how do they reach out to you? Um, is, do you have a website or any social media like that, or do they have to go through your uh, practice in New York? Well, as you may imagine, John, and I say this with some sadness, actually. I mean, I can't, I can't communicate with everybody. I can't help. Right. If people work at it and you know Google me, they usually find some way of getting a hold of me. Uh, I don't make it 
super easy. First of all, I'm extremely busy, not only as a, somebody who does this work, but also as somebody who writes, somebody who, you know, has a, a full practice. Right. I, I remain a full-time professor of psychiatry. So I'm, I'm not trying to be a little cute about it, but I'm saying if people really feel they, they absolutely need to talk to me, you know, they usually find ways of getting hold of me. I mean, I haven't hidden where I am and stuff. Um, on the other hand, I just, you know, and you understand, I can't, you know, I can't evaluate, you know, 50 cases a week, you know. So, uh, but again, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to imply that I'm the only psychiatrist in the world. Right. And stuff. They may have to approach their local clergy if their local clergy are believers in this stuff, you know, whether, whether Protestant or Catholic or for that matter, even Muslim. Um, you know, they, they can usually find somebody who will try to be objective about evaluating them. So it's not like everybody has to see right. that. So when it comes to the uh, International Associ Association of Exorcists, I picture this big meeting room, obviously pre-pandemic, when you could all get together. Is that is that how I picture it? Or is there something where you guys have like yearly meetings? Like how, what is that structure like in terms of? Well, until, until COVID, because, uh, you know, uh, last year's meeting and this year's meeting, you know, are canceled. Right. Uh, Italy has been hit hard, obviously. Uh, the meetings are in Italy, and we have tended to meet every two years. And you're right, it's it's a big convening. Most of the people are invited are exorcists. And then there's a few of us lay people who, you know, have had some involvement, you know, often as uh, medical people. And again, I don't want to give the impression like I'm the only psychiatrist in the world right. who believes in this stuff. I'm not. I know psychiatrists not only all over this country who believe in it, they may be a little more reluctant to speak out, but I also know, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists and, you know, there are even psychiatric nurses and stuff who get involved in this stuff. And, uh, you know, there, there are these people all over the world. Once again, I'm, uh, you know, not everybody has to, has to come see me. Well, uh, Dr. Gallagher, this has been awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise, your humbleness. Uh, again, Demonic Bows is out, folks. Please pick it up. And uh, thank you for your time today, Dr. Gallagher. Well, it was a pleasure. You, you're, you're a very good interviewer, so uh, I hope I was able to respond in uh, ways that you found helpful. Well, thank you. appreciate it, sir. Thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you liked what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. Thank you.